Um, welcome to the seventh episode of the Five Essex Court Sofa Series. Um, I'm Fiona Barton of Silkin Chambers and today Alex Eustich and Aaron Moss from our Chambers Information Law team are joined by Dennis Lee and Oliver Willis from BDB Pitmans. They're going to present a joint session giving you a practical guide to the GDPR. It's almost two years now since the legislation came into force and in that time we've all had the benefit of seeing how the GDPR works in practice. In particular and perhaps most importantly how the ICO is wielding its considerable powers. We're conscious that today we have a very wide range of experience signed up to this webinar and so this session is pitched with lay clients in mind. We're going to highlight the need to know principles in what I hope is a practical and user friendly way. You are invited to send in any questions you may have via the chat box function. We will do our best to answer a few of them as we go through the session, if time allows but the follow-up summary mail shot which will be sent after the webinar will also include a selection of questions and answers from today. Thank you for signing up to the webinar and joining us. I'm going to hand over to Alex who will kick off the session by identifying some of the key lessons from the last two years. Alex, over to you. Thank you Fiona. Hello everyone. Um, as I speak, there should be links popping up in the chat box, which George will be kindly putting in um, to various bits of guidance and cases and so on. So please follow that along. Uh, the GDPR turns two years old this month, and it's unlikely that many organizations will be tempted to bake it a cake and sing a happy birthday. Many will instead experience traumatic flashbacks to sitting through endless data protection talks and scrambling to get privacy policies in order about two years ago. Uh, as Oliver and Dennis will tell you in more detail later, when discussing data breaches and enforcement respectively, the sky has not fallen in since 2018, but the Information Commissioner has been flexing her muscle and clearly means business. The passage of these two years allows us to share some practical experiences and lessons learned from the front lines of data protection. Uh, in doing so, we draw on our experience of advising organizations and compliance issues and dealing with data protection litigation when things perhaps go a little wrong. Today, um, I will share a handful of practical tips based on common errors or misconceptions which I came across over the last uh, few years. Tip one, understand the relationship between the GDPR and the Data Protection Act 2018. Apply them both. GDPR sets out the mandatory minimums for data protection EU-wide and can be relied on by individuals directly, but it's also recognized that member states have a unique domestic situation and needs. It allows them to elaborate on the GDPR framework in domestic legislation. Here, this is done by the Data Protection Act, DPA. DPA and GDPR are like two pieces of a jigsaw and they only make sense when pieced together. Uh, in my experience, it's a common pit pitfall to look at or rely on one but to ignore the other. This makes life more difficult as the DPA contains crucial exemptions which actually benefit your organization. For example, the DPA in Schedule 2 sets out various exemptions from data subjects right of access and notification. The DPA also has specific exemptions for particular organizations, for example, the Charity Commission. Another example is uh, Article 9 of the GDPR, which has to do with conditions for processing special category data, uh, what was known as sensitive personal data under the old regime. This includes processing in the substantial public interest, which for those of you particularly uh, working within public authorities or public bodies comes up quite often. But unless you consult part two of schedule one of the DPA, you would not, you'd be none the wiser about what that actually means in practice. So when dealing with any data protection issues, have copies of both documents in front of you and read them together. Uh, tip two, appreciate that mere retention of personal data still amounts to processing of data. Now, data protection legislation applies to any processing of personal data, but it's a common misconception that only active use of personal data, such as disclosure to a third party, is processing and so requires justification. Unfortunately, simply having the data in your computer system means there is ongoing daily processing. 
Now imagine that your organization had the misfortune of being hacked. You report this to the ICO and disclose to the commissioner that customer data from 15 years ago was one of the items taken. The commissioner will want to know why you still have that data in the first place. Uh, generally, personal data becomes less relevant and thus less necessary to keep as time goes by. The way to deal with it is by having an inventory of data held and ensuring there remains an ongoing legal basis, basis for retention. Often, uh, this is done via a specific retention and deletion uh, policy with some review periods and deletion periods. Uh, if this isn't done, the controller may face not only ICO penalties, but also claims by data subjects. And importantly, limitation won't be an issue because retention will effectively refresh the sex six year limitation period each day that the data is held. Uh, tip three, make necessity your mantra. Uh, unless you have data subjects explicit, specific, and unambiguous consent, you will need to show a specific legal basis under GDPR and or DPA to use that data. Now, there are dozens of these in le legislation, but the key thread which runs through them all is necessity. Is it necessary to use the data in the way that you intend? If you actively consider necessity when dealing with personal data, you are unlikely to go far off course. And if you take away anything from my bit of the talk today, it is that. Think about necessity. Some specific questions I suggest asking yourself when considering necessity are, A, does our privacy policy or notice flag up this use and the legal basis for it? If not, you might wanna ask why not? Should it be amended to cover it? And should we notify the individuals concerned that their data is being used in this way? B, can we reasonably achieve the same result or goal in a less intrusive way? For example, anonymizing the data. C, if the data subject sues us five years and 11 months from now, i.e. just before that expiry of the uh, limitation period, how would we evidence having properly considered lawful basis and necessity? And that's all about keeping an audit trail. A common pitfall is to say, well, we have a privacy policy, so that's good enough to cover any use of the data. Now that blanket approach won't get us very far with the commissioner or the courts. This is demonstrated in the recent Supreme Court decision in El Ghazuli, um, linked in your chat box about the transfer of evidence on the, one of the so-called ISIS beetles to the USA. The government got home on the common law challenge, but fell down on the data protection challenge. It had not properly and expressly considered the issue of data protection in accordance with the relevant procedural requirements. And the Supreme Court said that substantial compliance is not enough. One has to actually consider the legislation. You need to record and evidence that specific consideration in the individual circumstances of each scenario or project or individual use that you're propo proposing to take. And this is especially important for public authorities as you'll also be expected to show consideration of proportionality under Article 8 of the European Convention. Uh, just to flag up two specific documents you are likely to need at some point. Uh, the first is an appropriate policy document and that's when dealing with special category sensitive personal data or criminal conviction data. This requirement is found in part two, schedule one of the DPA, and it's a prerequisite for relying on many of the legal bases for processing such data. And if you haven't got that in place, you might be in difficulty uh, if you would have otherwise uh, sailed through the necessity exercise. And secondly, a data protection impact assessment, a DPIA. So this arises under article 35 of the GDPR and it's often overlooked. The requirement for DPIA is triggered by processing which is likely to result in a high risk to individuals' rights. DPIA will evidence those risks, the necessity for them, risk mitigation, and so on. At first, it might seem like an additional annoying bit of paperwork, but actually it forces you to go through the uh, creation of an audit trail process and consideration of all the factors, and it can actually be quite helpful in high-risk scenarios. Uh, that requirement is often triggered when a particular project or operation involves handling large amounts uh, of sensitive data. Uh, to give you a, a current events example, the centralized COVID tracing app uh, being piloted on the Isle of Wight may well trigger this requirement. Um, we will hear today from Dennis in a bit that organizations which show that they're taking compliance seriously are less likely to attract fines and enforcement action from the ICO. Having these documents in place will go a long way toward doing that, even if things do go wrong, which unfortunately, they do often. Uh, tip four, identify the nature of your data relationships. 
uh, any large organizations will be in the center of a web of relationships involving data transfer. Uh, deciding whether you're a data controller or a data processor is usually fairly straightforward. Uh, but what many organizations don't consider is whether they're a joint controller as defined under Article 26 GDPR, as where two or more controllers jointly determine the purposes and means of processing. What does this mean in practice and why should you care? To take a hypothetical COVID year example, an infectious disease center uh, doing research and a care home decide to carry out a study on the effectiveness of certain COVID treatments on the elderly. Both organizations decide the scope and method of the study before the data is pooled for their joint use. They're both joint data controllers. Why does it matter? Well, two practical reasons. Article 26 requires such a relationship to be documented in a transparent manner, which determines their respective responsibilities for compliance with the obligation. The essence of that agreement has to be available to data subjects, so they know who to make requests to. Now, if this agreement is not in place, it has to be in writing, the organizations will be in breach of GDPR. Uh, the second point, uh, under Article 26.3 of the GDPR, the data subject may exercise his or her GDPR rights against each of the controllers. The ITO guidance, uh, linked in your box, suggests that each joint controller will be liable for the entire damage caused by the processing unless it can prove that it is in no way responsible for the event giving rise to the damage. To avoid potentially holding the bucket for the other joint controller's mistakes, some contractual indemnities, indemnities may well be advisable, but you won't know to seek them unless you identify that joint controller relationship in the first place. Uh, this is a complicated area, uh, and if you think, based on this snippet, that your organization may be a joint controller, um, that, and that relationship hasn't been properly documented or indemnified and so on, please do get some advice. Uh, before I wrap up, I, I will quickly deal with a very good question which we received from a viewer uh, just before this session. So in summary, the question was, how does this all apply to information sharing within a single organization? This question falls neatly into the theme of pitfalls. Uh, it is often assumed that there is a carte blanche on transferring information within a large organization uh, with multiple branches and departments. The ICO data sharing code of practice makes clear this is not the case. It says that data protection principles apply to sharing data between different departments, for example, in the local authority, especially as different parts of the same organization can have very different uh, approaches to data protection depending on culture and functions. And as we discussed earlier, processing is very widely defined. Uh, so uh, moving it along in, in, between departments in a big organization can well trigger a justification need. Uh, whether internal data sharing needs to be justified at all and on what basis needs to be considered on the particular facts and using common sense. If your organization's legal department receives a pre-action claim letter and contacts complaints and operations departments, even if they're based in different offices, to help formulate those responses, that will almost certainly be justifiable in reference to the necessity of dealing with that litigation. Uh, but if the contact information from that complaint somehow ends up in the marketing department's mailing list, it will not be justifiable as it's not necessary to resolve the complaint or claim. Now, if the processing needs to be justified, then you need to look at your existing legal basis in the statute and in your privacy policies. In the context of a small charity, for example, with, uh, say, 10 staff, sharing the data between your volunteer management and your grants department is unlikely to require justification. Sharing of that data with a regulator uh, at the latter's request will be amply justified by its statutory function in carrying out investigations and regulation. In practice, uh, there have not been many cases or incidents about sharing with an organization where any problems have arisen. I expect the ICA's approach to internal sharing will be uh, significantly less onerous uh, than compared to uh, sharing between organizations and different data controllers. Uh, on that note, um, I will now pass uh, the virtual microphone on to Dennis Lee to update us on the ICA's approach to enforcement over the last two years. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, hi, uh, my name is Dennis Lee. I am a partner at the commercial team of BDB Pitman. And today I will talk a bit about um, how the ICO has approached enforcement. I do agree with Alex that the sky hasn't actually fallen in. Um, and we'll see how, um, how serious or not so serious um, how uh, the ICO has approached this over the last few years. Um, I will cover, in particular, how the ICO has approached implementation of fines, 
um, how it has uh, approached its regulatory action policy, and also how the organizations may best avoid regulatory action when dealing with the ICOs. Now, fines are obviously the ones that um, everyone will be most concerned about. Clearly, very soon after the GDPR came into force, organizations and businesses were very concerned about the possibility of big fines for breaches. And those fines that have been reported in the media undoubtedly send shivers down our spines in terms of the sheer size of the numbers. For instance, I would like to look at three particular cases. Uh, like recently in February earlier this year, uh, we were told that Cathay Pacific was fined 500,000 pounds for leaving its customers' data, uh, personal data exposed, uh, which was for a period of four years. Um, the amount is actually uh, calculated on the basis of um, the percentage of its turnover. And uh, it's very interesting to note that this was actually uh, investigated under the old legislation, which is the, the Data Protection Act 1998, because that was the period of its breach. If it was investigated under the GDPR, then undoubtedly the fine would have been much higher. And what were the problems there, actually? Um, it seems like they had uh, not uh, insufficiently good security measures. And these included uh, backup files that were not password protected, internet facing servers without the latest patches, operating systems that were no longer supported by the developer, and inadequate antivirus protection. All these things sound very familiar to all of us. Uh, another case that uh, most of you would have heard about is British Airways being fined for the eye-watering amount of 183 million. Um, yeah, that's absolutely uh, a scary size indeed. Um, that was 1.5% of its annual turnover for the year uh, 2018, which is when the, um, the, the incident happened. And the, the, the the breach there was that it diverted the uh, BA customer data to a fraudulent website where the hackers could harvest names, addresses, payment card details, and travel booking details as well. So as you can see, these are the things that really will, um, uh, the ICO will punish quite seriously. Um, also, around the same time, the ICO uh, announced that it would be finding Marriott International for the amount of 90, over 99 million. Now we are still waiting for a final decision from the ICO on whether they will actually issue these fines because both BA and Marriott have understandably made representations to the ICO and appealed these decisions. And the time period for the ICO to finalize its decisions have been extended time and time again so for now, we don't really know if BA and Marriott will eventually need to pay these fines or to pay anything at all, actually. Now, the ICO sends out regular updates and publishes on its website all the fines that it imposes. So you can get a good picture of just checking these updates. And those massive fines that make the headlines are certainly the ones that will stay in the public's mind. However, as we approach the second anniversary of the GDPR, if we take uh, if we look at the track record of the majority of the fines, the picture that emerges is not so black and white, actually. What is important to learn from the actions that have been taken so far is that we can see the ICO focuses more on certain types of breaches. So importantly, like in the case of the Cathay, BA and Marriott fines, it was to do with poor security measures being put in place or perhaps breaches relating to direct marketing, which is something that the, um, the ICO has already been uh, uh, very much focused on before the GDPR. And lastly, any breaches that raises public policy issues, such as misuse of data in political campaigning. So if we look at the ICO's own objectives for enforcement, which are set out in their regulatory action policy, the objectives there give a useful indicator of what the regulator would be focusing on. And these objectives include, firstly, swift and effective responses to breaches. And that any response has to be effective, proportionate, 
and consistent in its application of sanctions, in particular, targeting organizations and individuals suspected of repeated or willful misconduct or serious failures to take adequate steps to protect personal data. It will also use its powers where formal action serves as an important deterrent to those who risk non-compliance with data protection laws. And lastly, the need to proactively identify and mitigate new or emerging risks arising from changes in technology and society. So obviously, in light of the COVID-19 situation, something happening in society that we're currently going through, many public policy rules have been modified and slightly relaxed, and the ICO has temporarily updated its policy to explain how it will use its powers during the pandemic period. These include, it will focus its efforts on the most serious challenges and the greatest threats to the public. It will be flexible in its approach and will take into account the potential financial or resource burden its actions could place on organizations. And the ICO will take firm action against those who misuse personal data to try to take advantage of the current lockdown situation. Overall, the ICO's approach emphasizes the importance for organizations to show that they are aware of their responsibilities and are trying to fulfill them. So organizations that can demonstrate this are less likely to attract enforcement action or fines from the ICO. This obviously impacts on the way that organizations deal with subject access requests and personal data breaches because these are the two factors that are most likely to put an organization on the ICO's radar. For example, when you get complaints from a disgruntled data subject requester, or when having to report a data breach. Now, my next two colleagues uh, will deal with these, uh, these topics in the next two sessions. Um, organizations dealing with subject access requests or personal data breaches should plan and document their response with the aim of demonstrating that they can understand their obligations and are committed to fulfill them. So even if the organization's implementation leaves room for improvement, this approach is likely to garner much more sympathetic response from the ICO than an approach which comes across as either reluctant or cavalier. Now, before we go into more detail about how to deal with these two issues, and handing over to my next colleague, I would like to summarize with three points that we can learn from the last two years. Firstly, despite the fact that the ICO has not been minded to issue too large fines, too many large fines to date, it nonetheless is capable of doing so. And the BA and Marriott cases show the level of fines that organizations may be faced with. Secondly, during the current pandemic period, the ICO may be more flexible or understanding if organizations are struggling to meet their obligations when they do not currently have the resources to do so. But it would still take firm action if necessary, especially against those who are trying to exploit the pandemic situation to their advantage. And lastly, when faced with data subject access requests or personal data breaches, organizations would do well to demonstrate to the ICO that they understand their obligations and are committed to fulfilling them, even where the organization's implementation may not be perfect. And with that, I would like to hand over to Aaron now to share his views on responding to data subject access requests. Thank you, Dennis. Article 15 GDPR provides the subject right of access to their personal data. This is what, under the Data Protection Act, we referred to the 1998 Act, we referred to as a subject access request, a, a SAR. Although not strictly correct, given generally people still refer to Article 15 in that same way. We've chosen to single out Article 15 and include it in today's webinar because it's unusual in a couple of ways. First, it's a right which data subjects are likely to exercise. It's well known and it's useful. Secondly, the response of the Information Commissioner to breaches is often relatively soft touch, but it remains important for data controllers to get it right. In the next 10 minutes, I'm going to address two topics. First, 
the structure of Article 15 and the rights which the article bestows on data subjects against data controllers. Secondly, how data controllers may respond to subject access requests, how the regulator and the courts have responded to decisions taken by data controllers in refusing to disclose data. So first, the structure of Article 15. Article 15 provides a right of access to personal data and information. It's not a right of access to documents generally, but to information about those documents and data within those documents. That's important. It gives data controllers some flexibility in how they respond to requests. The right of access is a right for a data subject to obtain from the data controller confirmation as to whether or not personal data concerning him or her are being processed. And where that's the case, it's a right of access to that personal data, and it's a right to know some things. Those things are quite a list, but I'm going to give, give you most of the list. The purposes of the processing, the categories of data which are being processed, the recipient to whom the data will be disclosed, the period to which the data will be retained, the source of data where it's not collected from the data subject, whether automated decision making is being used, and the existence of other rights, including a right to complain and a right to request rectification of the data. When making a, a subject access request, it doesn't have to be in a specific format. It doesn't have to say on its face that it is an Article 15 request. It just needs to be clear that the person is asking for their own personal data. It doesn't have to have reference to the GDPR or the Data Protection Act, for example. The Information Commissioner said in a blog post in June 2019, and it's one of the links that you've, you've got in the chat, as people become more aware of their information rights, the Commissioner has recognised that there has been a significant rise in SARS across all sectors. Because Article 15 is on its face a really weighty right. It's a weighty right that data subjects exercise and do exercise. However, Article 23 GDPR provides that each country may restrict the scope of Article 15 rights insofar as such a measure respects the essence of Article 15 and insofar as such a measure is necessary and proportionate in a democratic society. In our domestic law, Article 23 has given rise to schedules 2, 3 and 4 of Part 2 of the Data Protection Act 2018. The guidance issued by the ICO, and again, you've got a link to this in the chat, is that exemptions are not to be routinely relied upon or applied in a blanket fashion. At the end of last year, the ICO prepared new draft guidance on right of access requests, specifically for data controllers, as opposed to aiming the guidance at data subjects. It opened a consultation that closed in February of this year, and the guidance is yet to be finalised, but we expect that it will be similar to the draft, and the draft does show the regulator's direction of travel. It's a very detailed document, nearly 80 pages long. The ICO notes that it's a fundamental right because it allows data subjects to understand how and why you as data controllers are using their data and to check you're doing it lawfully. So how should controllers respond to such requests? The draft guidance makes the sensible point that whether or not an organisation receives requests on a regular basis, it's important to be prepared and it's important to be proactive. Being so will ensure that a response can be effective and that it can be timely. Organisations should note that the statutory period for complying with the SAR is one calendar month. For an organisation that processes a lot of data, or where data are held separately, for example, by different employees of the same organisation, one month isn't a long time to process the request, recognise it as a SAR, to conduct searches for the data within the scope of the request, to take decisions as to what data will be disclosed and what you're going to say is exempt or what might be exempt, maybe take legal advice at that point as well, and to then prepare edited or, or redacted documents ready for disclosure to the data subject. So clearly, if you're going to respond in a month, and you have to, 
it's necessary to streamline the process. It's common for documents to contain data about more than one data subject. Where a SAR requires an organization to consider disclosing information from such a document, the first consideration is whether the document can be separated so that one subject doesn't receive data about another. But where that's not possible, a data controller should then consider whether they may disclose the mixed data to one subject with the consent of the other. But it may not be practicable to obtain this consent. For example, where to ask the consent of the second subject would unavoidably disclose the data to that second of the first subject. In those circumstances, the ICO considers that the data controller must themselves decide whether it's reasonable to disclose the data without consent. Now, clearly that puts quite a burden on data control. In DB and the General Medical Council, which is a court of appeal decision in late 2018, you'll see the link to Bailey in the chat. It was held that although in a mixed data case, the starting point is that the data should not be disclosed. That's not the same as there being a presumption that mixed data will not be disclosed. The court emphasized it's only a starting point and a data controller must go on to consider the reasonableness of all of the circumstances. A risk to organizations is that when responding to a subject access request, it's discovered that the organization has retained data in conflict with its retention policies. In such circumstances, it's still of course necessary to disclose the existence of the data and, and the data to the subject. But this leaves the organization vulnerable to a claim for unlawful processing of the data. In many ways, discouraging this sort of behavior is very much one of the purposes and key purpose of the right of access. The remedy to mitigate this risk is that organizations must be sure to keep their data well organized and to keep on top of retention and deletion schedules. The double benefit of doing this is it reduces the amount of information that an organization must review and then disclose when handling a SAR. In my experience, it's particularly helpful for a data controller processing a request to attempt to engage in a conversation with the data subject. What is the purpose? What is the subtext for their request? What are they hoping to be given? The answer may be a simple, I want everything you have, or it may quite fairly and quite often be, I don't have to tell you. But often, the use of a subject access request, a relatively blunt instrument, is a tool used by a data subject to get something particular, or to at least see whether an organization has that particular thing. By questioning the subject motive at the outset, albeit they're not obliged to give you an answer, it can avoid potentially protracted and expensive litigation and disagreement later on. So what has the regulator done in practice? In the last year, the Commissioner has recorded 25 instances of enforcement on her website. Of those, only one concerns subject access request in relation to the Met Police last year. At the time, the Met Police had a backlog of SARS well over the one month deadline with more than 1,000 requests outstanding. The response of the ICO was to allow the Met to propose its own timeline for clearing the backlog. Despite criticism by the regulator, there was no formal sanction against the Met at that stage. It should be remembered that the approach of the regulator to breaches of Article 15 is seemingly quite cautious, quite, quite gentle. This would be consistent with the fact that the regulator often seems more concerned with encouraging best practice to GDPR compliance, rather than using her full force to clamp down on any breaches. But errors and breaches do occur in Article 15 and in relation to the GDPR more generally. As to what to do when this happens, apart of course from picking up the phone and calling BDB Pitmans right away, Oliver will now tell you more. Thank you, Aaron. Yes, so this brings us to a personal data breach or sort of what to do when the worst happens. So we're just briefly going to look through, um, firstly, what's changed under the GDPR, then the sorts of questions you should be asking yourself if a breach does occur, 
And then finally, what your key objectives should be if you are in the position of having to report a breach to the ICO. But before we get into that, I think it's worth just taking a moment to think about what a personal data breach actually is. So within the terms of the GDPR, it's a breach of security leading to accidental or unlawful destruction, loss, alteration, unauthorized disclosure, or access to personal data. Now, the reason I mention this is because, of course, that means that not every breach of the GDPR will be a personal data breach. And so the points that we're going to discuss um, in this section of the series don't necessarily apply to every single breach of GDPR. The sorts of things that will qualify as personal data breaches are things like um, deliberate theft of personal data, either you know, physically or uh, through a cyber attack, or perhaps um, data accidentally being destroyed, um, for instance, if um, servers are, are damaged in, in a fire or physical uh, files are, are destroyed by something like a flood. So uh, with that in mind then, um, what changes did um, the GDPR introduce? Well, of course, the key change was that there's now an obligation to report personal data breaches that meet a certain threshold of seriousness. Failure to report a breach um, that reaches the threshold could result in enforcement action by the regulator. By contrast, before the GDPR, the ICO certainly encouraged self-reporting of breaches, but it wasn't mandatory. Now, in theory, the new rules uh, give data processors and controllers a clearer set of decisions to make when a breach occurs. However, in practice, uh, the new rules aren't always easy to apply. And certainly over the past two years, we've been seeing more inquiries um, from clients about this. So if your organization discovers a breach, what questions should you ask? Well, the first one is clearly how, uh, how you can contain the breach um, and um, how successfully you can do that. Now that's a practical question rather than a legal one. And of course, when we're talking about containment, that will mean very different things depending on the nature of the breach. So, for instance, if you've got a rogue employee who has left the organization and taken data uh, that he or she shouldn't have done, um, your containment measure will probably involve engaging with that employee, uh, possibly in quite strident terms, um, to persuade them of the error of their ways and the quite serious consequences that could follow. By contrast, if the breach involves a cyber attack, your containment measures are probably going to be more focused on understanding where the weakness uh, in the security lay and how you can correct that and make sure that the attack isn't ongoing. The reason why containment is so important is because it has a very direct impact on the degree of risk that the breach will pose to the individuals whose data might have been um, involved. And it's really those questions of risk that then influence um, your response to the breach and certainly which determine your obligations in terms of reporting either to the ICO uh, or, or possibly also to the data subjects themselves. Now, our experience in this area has certainly been um, that clients who are most able to contain the breach and take the most active measures to do that are usually also the ones who uh, overall have the best breach experience, if we can talk of things in that terms. Um, so, you know, particularly um, if we're thinking about um, the, the ultimate cost of the breach, management time, interactions with the data subjects and with the ICO, um, containment will help in all of those areas. So that's why it should always be the starting point. Once you've got uh, some sort of containment process underway, the next question to ask is um, whether you need to report the breach. Now, that question takes on a slightly different dimension depending on whether you're holding the data as a data processor or as a data controller. If you're holding it as a data processor, then the answer whether you need to report the breach is fairly simple. Um, you're required to report the breach to the data controller, and there isn't actually a sort of threshold in terms of seriousness for that. Having said that, once you've reported the breach to the data controller, you don't need to worry about um, reporting it to the ICO or to the data subjects, because that's ultimately a question for the controller to assess, and the obligation for making those reports sits with the controller. Of course, if you are the processor, then probably the controller is one of your customers. So of course, reporting a personal data breach can be a delicate business. 
Um, before making the report, you'll want to have a look at your contract with the controller and certainly consider the contractual and commercial consequences that might result from the breach. That, of course, might um, influence the way you, you engage with the controller about what's happened. If you're a data controller, um, then you've got two different questions to consider. Um, the first is whether you need to report the breach to uh, the data protection regulator, which of course is the ICO if you're in the UK. The second question is whether you have to notify individual data subjects about the breach. Now, reporting to the regulator is mandatory unless the breach is unlikely to result in a risk to individuals. Now, uh, when we're considering risk in this context, the main ones to consider are sort of basic risks to the individual's privacy, and then also risks to the individual's um, economic or material well-being. So for instance, um, if the breach involves a credit card information, clearly there's likely to be a, a higher risk of fraud there than if you're talking about other sorts of information which might not be quite so useful to a fraudster. So that's the question uh, and the threshold in terms of whether you report to the ICO, but you've got um, a different threshold in terms of whether you're reporting to the individuals themselves. Um, so you only have to report to the individuals if the breach is likely to result in a high risk to the rights of those individuals. So you'll note there, there's a lower threshold for reporting to the ICO, a higher threshold for reporting to the individuals concerned. And that of course means that some breaches uh, will meet the threshold for reporting to the ICO, but not be serious enough to meet the threshold for mandatory reporting to the individuals. Uh, as the controller, you are of course free to decide to voluntarily um, report to the individuals, and sometimes there are situations uh, where that's an appropriate thing to do. Now, you may have noticed that both of those thresholds uh, involve trying to predict the likely effect of a breach on data subjects. Um, in some instances, that's fairly straightforward. Uh, for instance, we assisted a client who'd suffered a breach when one of their senior managers left a laptop in a New York taxi. Fortunately, uh, on investigation, it emerged that the laptop had been encrypted to a high standard and all the data that was on the laptop was also accessible on backups. So in actual fact, there was no prospect of any risk to um, the individuals whose data had been on the laptop. In other situations, it's much harder to make that assessment. Uh, and particularly, that can be the case um, if it's taking time to establish the full extent of the breach. For instance, if you become aware that um, a cyber attacker has gained unauthorized access to a system, it may not be immediately obvious um, which data on the system has potentially been accessed by that attacker. And certainly um, we've seen instances where the only way to establish that has been for the controller involved to appoint forensic uh, computer experts to try and uh, work out what, if anything, may have been taken by people who had access to the system. Obviously, if you're in a situation like that, it's much harder to assess the risk to the individuals because you don't really know what data has actually um, been taken. So if you do find yourself um, in a position of um, having limited knowledge about, about the data that's actually been taken, um, sometimes the best you can do is to make an interim assessment of whether you think you're going to need to report whilst you conduct a fuller investigation. Now, that of course, that idea of making an interim assessment takes us on to the question of time scales and how long you have to um, make all these decisions. Now, if you're a, a processor um, and you're potentially going to have to report uh, a breach to the controller, then the legislation requires you to do that without undue delay after becoming aware of the breach. Uh, obviously, without undue delay um, is a bit of a movable feast, um, but you should be um, careful to check your contract with the controller in that instance, because it's very common for contracts to try and pin that down and put a more specific time limit on reporting. And sometimes um, those time limits may be a bit shorter than the idea of without undue delay actually implies. If you're a controller, and the breach meets the threshold for reporting to the ICO, then the legislation again requires you to do so without undue delay, but adds that where feasible, you should do so no later than 72 hours after becoming aware of the breach. Now, I think the main learning point um, from our work over the last two years in this area 
has been just how difficult it can be for a lot of organizations to collate all the necessary information and submit a report to the ICO within that 72 hour window. Um, those which have been kind of most successful in achieving uh, that timescale tend to be the ones who have planned in advance what they'll do in the event of a breach. Uh, but even then, um, achieving that timescale can be really quite challenging. Certainly, it does mean if you'd have any hope at all um, of achieving the timescale, you really do need to act very quickly um, when you first uh, become aware of the breach. Um, and certainly, um, you need to make sure that the people who uh, will need to make these key decisions are, are brought into the loop uh, as early as possible. Now, if you uh, find yourself in a situation where meeting that 72 hour time scale is going to be particularly difficult, then sometimes the best approach is to submit an interim report to the ICO. Now, an interim report will generally simply note that the breach has occurred, um, explain that an investigation is underway, and set some realistic timescales for submitting a full report. The legislation itself uh, acknowledges um, the possibility of reports to regulators being submitted in phases, uh, if not all the information is available at the outset. Um, and we've also found that in practice, the ICO seems to be fairly receptive to this kind of approach. Um, if you do take this approach, then of course, it's very important, having said that you're going to update the ICO by a particular date, that you actually do it uh, and actually set and train uh, the investigation that's going to allow you to um, make that kind of uh, full report in, in due course. The main advantage of um, taking this approach is that it effectively buys you some breathing space to establish exactly what's happened. Now, the reason that can be so valuable, A, is because it means you're less likely to make decisions about um, your response, which you might later come to regret. And secondly, um, that it can sometimes be the case that a breach looks less damaging um, following a proper investigation than it might have done at the outset. Now, that can be, uh, in particular, because investigations um, may help to establish mitigation steps that you can take to um, manage the risk to individuals and also to manage the risk of a similar breach happening in future. But it can also be the case that a, a proper investigation will manage to narrow down the scope of data that's involved in the breach. So for instance, uh, in the event of a cyber attack, you may find following an investigation that the, um, the data involved is, is much narrower in scope um, than you had initially feared. And when it comes to making a report, being able to provide um, a, that more accurate assessment and, and illustrate um, a more limited scope for the data is certainly uh, comforting. So um, in terms of that final report to the ICO, uh, what should your key aims be? Well, the GDPR sets out the types of information that need to be included in the breach report, so naturally your report needs to cover those points. But more broadly, um, your aims in terms of managing the breach will generally be to provide a coherent account of how the breach occurred and how you've contained it, what you're doing to mitigate the risks to individuals, and what you're going to do to mitigate the risk of a similar breach in future. The point of your report uh, in terms of managing the, the, the breach overall is really to demonstrate to the ICO that you understand the situation, that you understand your obligations and that you're taking appropriate steps to sort it out. The most effective uh, reports to the ICO will effectively end up preempting any recommendations that the ICO itself might have made. So if you can um, submit your report uh, showing that you've uh, identified what, rent went, what went wrong, and that you've identified some um, tangible mitigation steps to improve the situation and reduce future risk, um, it's very likely um, that you'll be effectively doing the ICO's work for it. Um, and that's likely to give the ICO confidence that it doesn't need to take uh, any further steps, unless, of course, the breach is um, particularly serious, like the ones that Dennis mentioned uh, in his part of the talk. So, uh, key takeaways then on data breach. I think you know the, the key point is that even the most careful organisations uh, can't entirely eliminate the risk of a personal data breach. 
um, and that when one happens, you do need to be in a position to make some quick decisions. However, um, quick decisions uh, shouldn't result in sort of hasty, ill-considered decisions. And if there's a risk of that happening, then um, really the best thing is generally to try and gain some additional time uh, to investigate, uh, take control of the situation, and then hopefully present the ICO and if necessary, the data subject with a coherent plan for how you're going to put things right. So I hope that's been useful as a whistle stop tour of um, personal data breach. And with that, I'll hand you back to Fiona to wrap things up. Many thanks to Oliver and Dennis from BDB Pitmans for jointly presenting this webinar with us today. Um, and my thanks to all our presenters for reducing what is undoubtedly a complex area of law to, I think, digestible key messages for us all to take away. Um, our thanks to you for joining us and we hope that you found the session useful and informative. This webinar is going to be uploaded onto Chambers YouTube channel by tomorrow afternoon and the speaker notes will be circulated um, by email next week. For those of you who might like to make our SOFA series a regular event in your diary, our webinar next Wednesday will be delivered by Anne Studd um, and Molly Joyce, who in light of the very cautious emergence from lockdown being likely to result eventually in a gradual increase in violent crime to pre-COVID levels, we will consider issues surrounding knife crime and stalking prevention orders. So we hope to see you next week. Meanwhile, stay safe and all the best from all at 5 Essex and BDB Pitmans. Bye. <laughs>